Uh, thank you, Sam, and thank you, the New York Academy of Sciences. It's a great honor and privilege to get to speak to you this afternoon. Uh, so, what I'm going to talk about, kind of tell you a story of how we got to where we are with looking at what we call now emergency preservation and resuscitation. We initially call it suspended animation, other people still do, but we're trying to get away from the sci fi notion of suspended animation. I do have to disclose a couple things. I'm a co author of a patent for our methodology, uh, which won't get me anything, but I just have to say it. And we have grant support from the U.S. Department of Defense, and I also should, I guess, to close my, my bias with like Lance, I believe that the limits are not just 10 minutes. So, so just to be clear, I'm not going to be talking about suspended animation to send people off to Jupiter and have them wake up when they get there. I'm um, also, also not going to talk about freezing people until the, whatever caused them to die has now been cured 50 years later. What I'm going to talk about is just figuring out how we can buy time to save people who are dying in front of us and we just can't fix them quickly enough. That's why it's a very important issue for trauma patients. So here's a, an example of a case, and this is uh, actually a case that I was involved with. I was a surgical resident. I actually spent, I was at the University of Pittsburgh, but we spent a couple of months at the Shock Trauma Center at the University of Maryland. And distinctly remember this young patient who came in, stabbed him with the heart. We did all the right things. He was at you know, one of the busiest and the best trauma centers in the world, and we couldn't save him. There was some sort of fight over some bowling shoes. But, you know, it, it's, it's very frustrating as a trauma surgeon, as a resuscitation person, to have somebody young and healthy a few minutes ago now dying in front of us. And little had been done to try to improve our outcome from these kinds of cases. Well, it just so happened that when I was a medical student, <clears throat> I answered an ad, and for those of you old enough to recall, there was a little piece of paper on a cork board on the wall. It wasn't uh, via the internet or anything like that looking for medical students to do cardiac arrest research. And I answered the ad and met this guy, Peter Saffer, who's known as the father of CPR. And this is a quick other historical point. The painting behind him here is the painting of a girl from the River Seine, a girl who died in the river, nobody ever knew who she was. But they used her face, her death mask, to design the face of a Annie for all of us who have taken CPR courses. This is really good Annie's face. And in deference to Lance's comment about we've been really interested in the brain for the last 20 years, well, in 1961, when the ABCs of CPR were put together, and Dr. Saffer was one of the key people proposing this, he went to A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. It's 1961, H. Hypothermia, start within 30 minutes if the patient's not waking up. So the idea has been around, it was kind of dormant for a long time, but it's been around for a long time. And we've already kind of heard a little bit about the current Heart Association guidelines of if you have a patient who's comatose, not waking up, not, meaningful, not having meaningful responses to uh, commands, that we should cool them down, or at least control the temperature between 32 and 36, and do this for 24 hours and then prevent fever thereafter. So that's now pretty much the standard of care post arrest in non trauma patients. Trauma patients are different. If you lost so much blood that your heart now does not beat, pushing on the chest isn't going to do much of anything. But we, we do it, but it doesn't have any good outcomes. And we know the outcome from cardiac arrest trauma is really bad. We do things more aggressively with trauma patients, probably because we can, we're certain we can cut it anything we want to. But we open the chest in the trauma bay, and we do that because we hope to find something we can fix, but also we can directly massage the heart to get better blood flow, and we can clamp the aorta so that whatever blood is in the circulation will go to the heart and brain, obviously the most uh, vulnerable organs to no blood flow. But the outcomes are terrible. This is a, a review paper 20 years ago from Peter Reed, and overall 7% survival. If you do all that stuff, put breathing tube in, give them blood, open the chest, all that stuff, less than 7%, and at shock trauma, I looked at the data there, it's less than 5%. It hasn't changed in 20 years. So we've got to do something better. So I was trying to get some idea of how we might do something better. Peter Saffer, along with Ron Bellamy, who's a colonel in the US Army, looking at some data from the Vietnam War, looked at when soldiers who died of injuries were killed in action, when did they actually die? And yeah, there are some that died immediately, and they got injuries we're not going to be able to fix. 
But if you look at this graph, there are people who died five minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. That's a time frame in which if you had something novel you could do just to kind of stop the clock, buy some time, maybe you could save them. And the other really important point is a lot of them, they actually did autopsies on, on all of them. They are, often had injuries that are fixable. So you got somebody that's got an injury, it's fixable, but you just don't have time to fix it. So what can we do to, to try to save them? And that's where we came around with this, this term that we now call emergency preservation resuscitation or protection, the preservation of the whole body during a period of no blood flow, maybe two hours, maybe longer, to allow transportation, control bleeding, and then delayed resuscitation. And hopefully people will survive, otherwise lethal injuries. Again, all we're doing is trying to buy time. So how can we do it? Well, we came up with a magic potion and maybe some that magic cocktail we could do it, but we don't have that yet. So our initial thought was, what about hypothermia? So there were several influences on why we thought hypothermia could be the answer. One being hypothermia with cardiac arrest, as we've already been hearing about this. Uh, if you haven't seen this picture, this is a picture of a patient who had a cardiac arrest in a grocery store and the enthusiastic medics threw piles of frozen french fries on him to start cooling him down before they even transport him. We also know that there are many reports of people drowning in cold water, being underwater for an hour or more, and then being resuscitated. So if you cool fast enough, you can survive a long period of no blood flow. And then circuitry arrest, our cardiac surgeons have been stopping all the circulation in the body for over 50 years just to be able to operate on the heart and the aorta. So using all that, it seemed to us like hypothermia could be the answer. Now hypothermia does a lot more things than just decreasing the metabolism, which is the main thing we're thinking about, and, and this has already been mentioned today, but you decrease metabolic rate, decrease inflammation, decrease oxidative stress, and reperfusion injury, decrease cell death. But certainly in the trauma world, there's a bit of an yin and yang with hypothermia, because it causes cardiopathy, the blood doesn't clot as well when you're cold, so you can bleed more, they're stressed, they're shivering. And in the trauma world, we teach all of our trainees that there's this triad of death. That if you get acidotic, you get coagulopathic, you can't, your, your blood can't clot well, and you're hypothermic, you're gonna die. So we try to prevent this. This is the, the surgical trauma dogma right now. But if you look at the data, yes, the higher the injury severity score, the lower the temperature, and the worse the mortality, but really is the mortality just because of the other things that cause you to lose temperature than the actual temperature effect itself. Now, I'll posit to you that there's a big difference between exposure hypothermia, which is what we're talking about on trauma patients, or here is Napoleon's man, versus therapeutic hypothermia, which will add 10 years to your life. Which certainly, in the trauma world, this is what this sounds like. But we ignored that and, and took this to the lab. This is just a picture of Peter Saffer all the way on the left here, along with some of our techs and fellows who did a lot of this work in the lab. And Packa Hannock, who's in the middle on the right, is now the director of the Saffer Center. And we came up with this idea that the fastest way we could cool the whole body, particularly the brain and the heart, would be just to flush the body with cold fluid, just cold saline that we use as salt water. And if you put a catheter way up in the aorta, you could do this, and you could, if you want to, have a balloon in there so you could get the heart and brain cold fast. What we found is that once we started to do a longer period of no blood flow, we had issues because we weren't protecting the spinal cord, we weren't protecting the gut. So most of the studies that we did, we just cooled the whole body as fast as possible, just with pumping in a large amount of cold fluid. This is a diagram of what we're talking about, of the pink line being the blood pressure, the animal bleeds. We actually induce ventricular fibrillation, so the heart actually stops at exactly the time we say it stops. Wait a couple minutes, then flush them with this cold fluid, get them down to the goal temperature for that study, and then leave them there. And we went from 15 minutes up to three hours. That's three hours of no blood flow. Plenty of time for us to go off and have a nice leisurely lunch, come back and resuscitate them. But clinically, that would be the time where you're rushing to the operating room and you're trying to stop the bleeding. And when they're as cold as we took them, then you've got to restore blood flow using the heart lung machine, a cardiac pulmonary bypass. And we continue mild hypothermia at 34, at 34 for uh, at least 12 hours. And it's easy to march out kind of a dose response. If you just want 15 minutes of no blood flow, you have to cool down to about 34 degrees. But when we're talking about 90 minutes, two hours of no blood flow, we're talking about cooling the brain to 10 degrees centigrade, which is about 50 Fahrenheit, very cold temperatures. 
but it takes a ton of fluid to do that. And I won't go into all the studies that we did, but uh, Peter Saffer and Pat Kahanek, after drinking a couple of bottles of red wine, came up with this simplified diagram <laughs> of what's going on in the brain with ischemia and reperfusion. And based on that, actually everything on here is theoretically correct, but came up with a whole bunch of drugs to look at. We didn't do a, little, a lot with combining them, but maybe that is part of the answer. The only drug that seemed to have a little bit of benefit was Temple, it was a powerful antioxidant. But really, it's the hypothermia. Now, I'll just say one quick study that we did is really important to where we are today, where we actually added some trauma to this. So, it's a study of prolonged hemorrhagic shock to the point of no blood flow. <clears throat> and then we actually randomized the animals to getting CPR, giving them their own blood back, doing what we would do with our patients, or cool them down, leave them there for another hour of no blood flow, and then resuscitate all of them with a heart lung machine. And just to make it more realistic, we actually hooked in the abdomen, injured the spleen, and took the spleen out later. So it was really trauma, really hammering, really cardiac arrest. And this is the overall performance category, similar to the serial performance categories now used in patients. One is good, five is bad, and you can see that with CPR, none of them survived. With EPR, sorry, uh, they did well, they mostly survived. If we had 12 hours of post arrest mild hypothermia, some of them had neurologic deficits. They did much better if you have prolonged post-arrest mild hypothermia. We're not the only ones looking at this. Hassan Alam, Peter Reed done some similar work. Uh, they use a fancy fluid that's got a whole bunch of goodies in there for cold and for store. Uh, that's actually designed for storing uh, organs for organ transplantation now. Yeah, an open chest model. But they found a couple things that are really important in terms of taking this to the clinical world. The faster you cool, the better in terms of survival. Rewarming, probably want to go kind of medium in terms of how fast you rewarm. But they also did a study where they did added a bunch of injuries. They fixed all the injuries and all the animals were cold, and they reproduced them and they did, did well. So we thought it was time to take this to our patients. So this is a study that we're currently doing at the Stark Trauma Center at the University of Maryland. It's called the Emergency Preservation and Resuscitation for Cardiac Arrest and Trauma Trial, the EPR CAT. Our aims are to rapidly identify patients who might be candidates for this within five minutes of losing a pulse, to then cool them down as fast as possible to get the brain down to 10 to 15 degrees centigrade, so again, 50, 55, 58 uh, Fahrenheit, using just a flush of ice cold saline, stop the bleeding, and then resuscitate them with our lung machine. And obviously our goal is that people survive, and not just survive, but they survive without significant neurologic deficits and go back to being normal and healthy people. For the moment, anyway, we're looking at patients with penetrating trauma, 18 to 65 years of age, that have to have had signs of life within five minutes of getting to the hospital. We're trying to thread that fine line between doing something to somebody that's gonna do well anyway, or doing something to somebody that's gonna die no matter what we do, and trying to help the ones in between. And again, we're not trying to resuscitate people who are dead. We're trying to stop people who are in the process of dying from dying in front of us. The usual kinds of exclusion for this kind of study, but we clearly don't want people with traumatic brain injury or a cystic, which means they've probably been in arrest a lot longer than we think they've been in arrest. And probably just see prisoners with the usual kind of exclusions. Again, similar to the animal model, the patients are bleeding, they lose a pulse, we open the chest, we don't get them back immediately. We say, okay, we're going to do EPR. We flush them with the ice cold fluid, rush them to the operating room, and resuscitate them in delayed fashion using bypass. This is a diagram showing how we put this cannula directly into the aorta. Because in the trauma patient, we've already opened the chest. The heart's right there, the aorta's right there. Very easy for us to do this. And it's also easy for us to just open up a small part of the right side of the heart, let it all drain out, and then we suction that, that blood out. We're looking for survival without neurologic deficits, direct complications, coagulation problems, organ failures, but ideally long-term survival without significant neurologic dysfunction. As you can imagine, this takes a huge team. We've got the trauma surgeons, we've got the trauma resuscitation unit, trauma anesthesiologists, perfusionists, cardiac surgeons, the operating room staff, cardiac anesthesiologists, blood bank, and many of the others. So we have to train everybody together. This is the picture we took the first time we did a training session. This is almost 10 years ago that we did this. 
And our goal right now, this is the way that we've designed the study with the FDA, is that we're going to enroll 10 people who get EPR, and then 10 patients who meet the same criteria, but we don't have the whole team around. So I'm part of the team, I'm not there. Like today, if somebody rolled in and met the criteria, we could enroll that person as a control patient. We're also looking at historical controls. So one final couple comments here. To do a study like this, you obviously can't get consent from the patients. So the process we have to go through community consultation, public disclosure, and once things get out into the news, to the press, it's hard to control what happens with it. So this this study, <laughs> this um, article came out, uh, Killing a Patient Saves Life, my second day working at the University of Maryland, our, our media office was really excited to see me that day. Uh, when we did our, our community consultation in Baltimore, we made it on the front page of the Sun, you also have to give people the option of opting out. But as I said, once it's out there, it's out there. And even TV shows can pick up on it. Can you get sound up? I'm going to need some suction. I'm replacing all the patient's blood with ice cold saline. Who can tell me why? The theory of cold infusion that can create a temporary suspension of animation. Bingo. That's a man on a table, the app. We're going to kill him to save him. The cold infusion. It's an experimental procedure. So he's right. <laughs> this was this is the first patient on the first episode of the TV show Code Black, and there's also one on uh, Grey's Anatomy. I would say both of those patients survived. That's I think I think we're two for two. <laughs> so you know, we're, we're obviously still working on the study. We're, we are doing it. We're learning a lot as we're moving it forward, but we certainly hope that. This kind of approach of basically just trying to stop the clock by time with hypothermia, maybe with drugs or other ways to do this, will allow us to save the trauma patients that are currently dying in front of us. It may actually be some benefit, help benefit to other patients. And once we can prove this works here, we can expand the utility of this technique. But hopefully, in the future, we're going to have patients survive that otherwise would not. Thank you very much.